Welcome to SIPS Australia and New Zealand webinar. The webinar is entitled, Can You Still Run a Business with Respect to Human and in Human Rights and Make Money? Welcome to everyone. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we meet on today and pay our respects to their elders, past and present and emerging. In addition to our New Zealand neighbours, Tinakoko, Tinakoko, Tinakoko Katawa. Welcome. We have over 200 registered attendees today at the webinar, a testament to the interest that many have for this topic. For those of you who don't know us, the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply, or SIPS, is your global professional body for procurement and supply professionals. We're dedicated to promoting best practice, continuous improvement in professional standards, and raising awareness of the contribution that procurement and supply management can make to organisations. We exist for the public good. We're here to build the procurement capabilities of people and organisations so that they're trusted, that they've passed the highest procurement standards, code of conduct and ethics, and to strive to do the right thing throughout the supply chain. We believe that procurement has a significant role in driving social change and social impact. And SIPS is really excited to be presenting this webinar today. This is a great opportunity to further explore the positive influence that procurement and supply chain management can have on eradicating modern slavery and tackling human rights issues. But now for a few housekeeping. Uh, I'd first like to advise you that this webinar is currently being recorded and that will be made available to all attendees next week. Also, that you've all been muted during the presentation. However, we don't want you to stop talking. There is the chat box, so please do write comments. And when you do, um, make sure that you either share with the panellists or share with all attendees. And why don't you, for starters, tell us where you're all from um, and, and do send a, a big hi out to the rest of your um, the attendees on the presentation today. If you have any specific questions, then we do want you to put them in the Q&A box. The Q&A box is on the left of the chat box, and we will attend to these questions during the Q&A session. And now for our speakers, Andrew, Nicholas, Robin and Petey. Firstly, Andrew Banks. Andrew Banks is an English-Australian businessman and film producer. He co-founded recruitment company Morgan and & Banks and founded HR business process outsourcing provider Talent2 International. The company employed over 1,600 professionals in 20 countries, sold equity in 2014 to the Allegis Group of Maryland, a 16 billion US staffing giant. He was one of the sharks on the television series Shark Tank. His core business activities comes from his corporate HR training with involvement in building and growing companies in the recruiting, training and HR outsourcing space. Our second speaker, Nicholas Bernhardt. Nicholas is CEO and co-founder of a corporate social responsibility tech startup, Informed 365. Informed 365, has one simple mission, to help users see, the un see and understand their corporate social responsibility data. Inform 365 helps any organisation from non-profits to global enterprises to governments to, visual critical, to visualise critical data in a meaningful way that allows them to effectively use data to make more informed decisions and improve efficiency in the business. He is an ex-investment banker who held senior management roles at Standard Chartered Bank, Nomura Securities, Emiko Financial Services. Also, our third speaker, Robin Mellon. Robin is one of Australia's experts on property, construction, supply chain and sustainability in the built environment. He is CEO of Better Sydney, Project Manager for the Property Council of Australia's Modern Slavery Working Group and New South Wales Program Advisor for Better Building Finance. Robin was formerly CEO of the Supply Chain Sustainability School, the COO of the Green Building Council of Australia and Chair of the World Green Building Council's Asia-Pacific Network. Our final speaker, Petey Walker. 
Edie is the General Manager for Project Management and Direct Procurement for Stocklands, one of the largest diversified property groups in Australia with over 15 billion of real estate asset. She leads the design and construction delivery of developments and the portfolio, man portfolio management of assets and also leads their Modern Slavery Steering Committee. She has over 25 years of experience in the property and construction industry, both in Australia and internationally, and a wealth of knowledge in contractor and supply management. She joins Robin Mallon in a collaboration case study with Property Council of Australia, working together to address modern slavery. Without further ado, I'd like to warmly welcome Andrew, our first speaker, to join us with his perspective on purpose-led business. Andrew, over to you. Okay. Um, can somebody, can somebody enable my, uh, my uh, video? Can you hear me all right? You can hear me and see me, can you? Oh, good. Can see. All right. I couldn't, I couldn't see it here. So uh, welcome everybody. It's, uh, it's good to be here. And um, I, I'll briefly kind of, introduced my section by saying that, you know, in, in January of 2019, something very interesting happened, which is a very influential investor, a man called Larry Fink from Blacklock, urged all uh, their investor companies and CEOs uh, that they were only going to invest in companies that made a positive contribution to society. And he was going to hold them account. And the reason why they listened to him was because he had six trillion dollars in BlackRock's account. That is T with a trillion, yeah. And so when someone turns up at your meeting uh, to either invest or your shareholder meeting, and, the, and you know they're the world's largest investor, you take notice. So from a top-down perspective, the idea that you can build businesses, should build businesses that don't just make a profit, but that basically make a positive contribution to society was becoming valid. And um, to give you a simple example, he was shining a light on the fact of, let's take something that's probably controversial because I used to smoke, but tobacco is a controversial topic. You might invest in a tobacco company and the shares may do well, but in 20 years, you're by definition costing the healthcare services of your, of your country, uh, you're creating a burden. So he was simply saying that, Companies that manage pension funds and, and funds for lots of other people need to think about the decisions they make. So that was happening at a top-down level, and that obviously included sustainability, human rights, a positive contribution, clearly things like modern slavery, anything that was potentially negative towards society, not positive. Now, at the same time, I'm lucky enough to get a week at Harvard each year. I was never smart enough to go there as a graduate, but they let me in once a year with a whole bunch of businessmen because I've, I've kind of got real world experience. And we, we road test their MBA topics for the year. And I asked the professor the question, what's the single biggest thing happening in AI or in artificial intelligence this year? And he said, Andrew, there's over a thousand companies developing algorithms that track consumer behaviors uh, particularly around sustainability, ethics, and human rights, because more and more companies uh, need to understand that their product services, which includes their supply chains, are going to be evaluated in real time, in seconds, and consumers are going to be advised, well, you know, given these things are important to you, you should probably think twice about buying that product or that service. So you've got top-down, investor money, bottom-up, all driving this change. And then concurrent with that, and in this sort of COVID world, when I thought about the disruption that's going on in supply chains, and for, for many of you who are involved in that business, having to suddenly think about new choices and reliability of service and, and um, you know, spreading the risk because things were disrupted and still are, it occurred to me that as an investor in new businesses, when I think about the decisions I make to invest, they're very similar to, I'm sure, the decisions you'd make in choosing someone in a supply chain. Because I think about, can I trust them? Uh, do they provide value for money for their product or service? Will they deliver? Will they do what they say? And how will their actions impact on my reputation and, and the things that I feel strongly about? In your case, the companies you represent and the risk uh, and their reputation of that company. 
So I thought there was an interesting parallel in both investing and then choosing. That. And that kind of leads me to really why I invested in, in, uh, in Form 365, because I couldn't find an easy, cost-effective software that made these things easy and accessible and transparent. And so as you go about your business in thinking about diversifying, diversifying your supply chain, you're going to introduce new actors. Most of them are going to be good actors, but you need a communication method and you need to think about the choices you make. And, and that's obviously uh, our speakers will go on to talk about things uh, that impact on serious issues like modern slavery and human rights. But really, it can be anything, sustainability, carbon footprint, just things you and your company and your team feel strongly about. Uh, and, you know, with that introduction of lots of new actors, you've got to be careful because some of them will be bad actors. And so you've got to make sure that nothing in your supply chain would in any way endanger risk or reputation. And the other thing I think in this COVID unfriendly world is, is a renewed uh, respect for, let's call them serious experts. And that's why you can see how anything uh, get, engages very quickly in social media and can get sort of momentum. So I think it's very important that um, people in your profession and in your role think very carefully about the decisions you make. So there are the parallels. Um, I think I've used less than my 10 minutes of intro, so I'm going to hand over to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And over to you, Nicholas. Uh, if someone could just start my video, please, that would be great. Nicholas, good to go, Nicholas. We can hear you. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks very much, Sharon. Uh, first of all, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from where I've called in today. It's the U Gamb of Southeast Queensland, North and New South Wales, and pay my respects to elders past and present. Uh, so today, today I'm just going to briefly cover off why resilient supply chains are becoming more and more critical and unfortunately I'm pretty much on cue. We're currently in the midst of COVID-19, an event that has literally heightened the awareness and need for organisations to develop more resilient supply chains, have better visibility and have better transparency within their supply chains. The other thing that COVID-19 has, has shown uh, very clearly is that even the most established, long-term secure supply chains struggle when they're faced with such an unprecedented event. And those are some of the challenges that um, are becoming more and more um, relevant and more often, they're, they're happening more often as well, because there's a whole range of, and I'll call it modern day interruptions that businesses have to deal with. Other uh, events might be political and government changes, which could lead to sanctions and embargoes. Uh, you've got economic instability in a country or an entire region. Um, add in environmental disasters, extreme weather events, climate change impacts. And if that wasn't enough, we can throw in cyber attacks, threats to data integrity and the like. But I guess it all sort of ties in with the very, very complex, and I think uh, Robin always mentions the beautiful interconnectivity, I can't uh, pronounce it as well as he does, of supply chains where even one small issue or bottleneck can have a huge impact on the entire supply chain. So Nicholas, everyone... just, one... Nicholas yep. just one moment there. We can't see your face and it'd be great to see your face. Are you able to turn on your video screen, please? Oh, sorry about that. I'm trying to, but the host, uh, um, oh, there we go. Now I'm starting my video. Perfect. There we go. In all my glory. My apologies for that. Thank you. Let's talk a bit about consequences of, um, of supply. We've also got decreased revenue. And on the flip side, 
you typically will have a higher cost because you might have to source your products or your goods from uh, other suppliers who know that you're in a bit of a pickle. There's reputational damage, there's dissatisfied customers, there's stakeholder concerns. So all of these challenges in the procurement arena are becoming more sort of acute as we go along. And unfortunately, the traditional methods of managing supply, supply chains simply don't work anymore because many of them are reactive, risks are viewed in isolation, and typically action is only taken once the horse has literally bolted out of the gate. One other thing, and this is something that uh, Robin and PT will talk about a bit later, it's also called for more collaboration in this space. And we'll, we'll particularly talk about uh, uh, modern slavery a little bit later in this session. But that's sort of an indicator of where I think industry needs to go. We need to collaborate and stop for, uh, organizations operating in their very restricted silo, covering just their little supply chain universe, because everything is interconnected. And so hence, we need to start collaborating in this space. Uh, how can um, organizations get better visibility in their supply chain? Well, it is understanding your supply chain and, and sort of unraveling the risks within your supply chain. And where do you start? You start with your tier one suppliers. Now, I, can, I, I could almost hear sort of a, a, a major sigh in this room if I was in a room here. Um, it all sounds really easy. Let's just look at our tier one suppliers. But you'd be surprised how many even large organizations even struggle just with that basic step of getting clarity around their tier one suppliers. And that's just uh, in modern slavery, but it could also be, as Andrew alluded to earlier, environmental issues, um, yeah, human right, other human rights issues, health and safety. So the other thing that uh, I'd like to mention is when you start engaging with suppliers, make sure that you also cover off other relevant metrics in a very collaborative manner, of course. You might want to look at the financial stability of your suppliers, climate change risk, where, where do you have clusters of suppliers that could come back and bite you if there was some kind of regional problem. And then once you have visibility into your tier one suppliers, then you move down your supply chain to your tiers two, tier three, et cetera. So that's sort of ve very much the basics around it, but I, I basically saved the best for Robin and uh, Petey that are gonna talk to you about the benefits of collaboration in supply chains, uh, and particularly around the shared modern slavery platform for the Property Council of Australia. And with that, over to you, Robin and Petey. Thank, thanks, Robin and Petey. And just a reminder for everyone that the, the Q&A um, chat space is available. So please make sure you have your questions and answers ready for the panellists. Over to you, Robin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me loud and clear? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Thank you for that check. What I'd like to do, if I may, just to, to start to this section is uh, go to an audience poll, uh, which you should be able to see up on screen in front of you. And I'd love um, everyone to participate uh, if they can, because what I'd really be fascinated in knowing is where you're starting to see human rights play uh, an important factor, an important part in your decision making. So on screen, there are six options. And I'd love to know if you can just lean forward in which of your personal and your professional procurement decisions, so a range of decisions, uh, business and private, are human rights already an important factor? Not you'd like them to be or you think they should be, but in which of these are they already an important factor? I'll give you a couple of, couple of seconds. Actually, I'll participate myself there, even though I know my own answers. Uh, there we go. So I'll give you a few more seconds. Um, What we're seeing and what we've been seeing over the last couple of years, uh, and it started in some sectors, some parts of the industry in particular, what we're seeing is that um, human rights, uh, modern slavery are fast becoming talking points, but we're not yet seeing that, uh, that translation from personal decisions, the decisions you might make uh, around, for example, clothing and apparel, that's the one up on the screen with 66%, that's the winner there, 
we're not necessarily seeing that flowing through. And I'm fascinated by this. This is a, a really good example. You can see the results on screen. Uh, clothing and apparel is up at 66%. Uh, we dropped down there, uh, food and beverage, toiletries, cosmetics and beauty. And banking and finance and uh, electronic IT phones and computers are probably the lowest there, which again, considering on our leverage, the spend that we have uh, in those is probably kind of fascinating. So thank you uh, all for participating. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as uh, Nicholas has mentioned, uh, and as we heard from Andrew at the very beginning, um, businesses, organizations really need to, to bury purpose uh, as, a, as a foundation stone. And human rights also needs to be a foundation stone, a, a cornerstone, of, of what you build, of your structure, of your strategy, of your output. The introduction of the Modern Slavery Act 2018, uh, so it's now coming into effect, the first reporting period, has really turned the spotlight onto human rights and, and modern slavery within organizations' uh, operations, their owner operations, but also their supply chains for, in some cases, the first time. And many organizations, uh, small, medium, large, in different sectors, are finding that actually human rights have not been a cornerstone, have not been a foundation stone of what they do. And they have um, a number of different issues then to try and uh, overcome. One of those, and the second bullet point, is around business coherence. And this is why I was fascinated by what uh, Andrew and Nicholas was saying. Business coherence is vital, and I'll explain what I mean by that especially when you have complex supply chains and looking at the, the uh, people participating today, we've got not just people from around Australia, but from uh, Nigeria, from India, from Canada, from New Zealand. These are complex supply chains. You need to send a coherent message to your supply chains, to your staff, your clients and your, your suppliers about your priorities and how human rights are a priority for your organization so that they're not getting conflicting information. Uh, for example, you want them to uh, reduce emissions and environmental impacts, but you also want them to reduce costs. Uh, you want them to improve human rights, uh, but you also want to uh, improve uh, environmental reporting um, or uh, deadlines. You need to have coherence within the business about the messages that you're sending your supply chains and that human rights is fundamental. Now, this is where I lead into uh, the case study. Sector collaboration can achieve so much, working across usually competing organizations, and that could be in telecommunications or in this case in property or food and beverage, to see what you can achieve collectively, not just the sum of your individual parts, but collectively. And that's why supplier collaboration is also essential. One, as Nicholas was pointing out, these supply chains are beautifully interconnected but you need to look at what you can achieve with your suppliers asking them to do something yes but providing something as well and so the property council of australia their national sustainability roundtable identified a couple of years ago one supply chains and two modern slavery with the the, uh, the new act as two key priorities and this was where an original group of 15 of the, the largest uh, and you know uh, most uh, organized most progressive organizations uh, identified these priorities and said that collectively they wanted to try and collect data, collect knowledge um, and improve uh, capacity building through their supply chains, not just tier one, not just tier two, but all the way through their supply chains. And this is where uh, we looked at uh, informed 365 as experts in the business to provide this platform to bring everyone together. Next slide, please. And so what we did when we launched this in November last year, and you can go to this page, this will be available uh, in the information afterwards, is one, uh, signify the, the collective, the collaborative leverage that all of these organizations have. And Pity will uh, in a moment talk about Stockland, but when you add up the, the multi-billion dollar procurement spend, it's 20 to $30 billion of procurement a year across these originally 15 and uh, now 21 organizations, the fact that they are taking modern slavery, human rights in their supply chains um, as an important issue is a very clear message to send. Next slide, please. And so working with Inform365, we've now developed this login as a supplier, for example, and that could be tier one, tier two, and so on down. You get sent a link, you get sent an invitation, you log in here. Next, supply, next uh, slide, please. 
And immediately you're going through a fairly simple supplier assessment, which gets more complex depending on the answers you put in from your supplier details and type of organization, level of education. What do you know about human rights? What are you doing about modern slavery? Next slide, please. But in each case, what was very important is that it wasn't just uh, an issue of a snapshot in time. What data can we collect about our suppliers now? but of education. And so as you go through uh, this collaborative platform, you find uh, links to educational materials. In this case, uh, an example about worker dialogue, the, the voice of the worker. How do you hear it? What does it look like? What does it look like in different countries? How can it be a positive thing? And then you'll see at the bottom of the screen links to Australian or international or human rights resources, which can help suppliers and their teams, their staff and their own supply chains to know more year on year and improve. Because if your suppliers are not improving, you're not improving either. Next slide, please. And so this is early days. This launched only in October. Uh, we've been going through uh, the pilot period. You'll see there's over a thousand suppliers engaged. Uh, 284 have already completed the assessment. And so we're starting to see not just the data, which is fascinating about suppliers and what they know, but we're starting to see the trends. Where are there gaps in people's knowledge? Is it around human rights or is it about the actions they need to take? Um, where geographically, and you'll see the, the map there, which Inform365 has produced, where do these two tier three, tier four, and so on supply chains go so that you can uh, build capacity either by topic or by sector or even geographically by area? Let's go over to uh, PT, who can tell you, uh, I guess, the insider's view from Stockland, one of these uh, major property development firms. Thanks very much, Robin. Um, yeah, so being part of the collaboration from Stockland's perspective, our purpose at Stockland is we believe there is a better way to live. And, and this collaboration's purpose is intrinsically linked to that. Um, it's about uh, giving the people within our supply chains a better way to live, um, removal of harm. But it's also about um, the suppliers being better. Um, so it's about creating efficiency for our suppliers. If we didn't do this collaboration, we would have all been going out to similar suppliers. We, we all use, um, you know, the same cleaners, the same contractors. Um, and asking them different sets of questions at different times of the year um, with different angles. And it would have been uh, an information overload, which would have increased their prices um, and, and probably just overwhelmed them. So um, it was around finding a better way to uh, approach it at an industry level. Um, so there was that efficiency piece. That was one piece. The other piece with the collaboration um, that Robin touched on was the scaled um, data, but also keeping that flexibility with, um, with being an individual company, being able to have targeted communications with the um, suppliers that you invited. So as a, as a um, member of um, the, the tool, we will have access to the scale data, but we're also able to go in and have detailed conversations with our suppliers around their responses to the data and around their journey, if you like, in an emerging space um, that is, uh, you know, it, it's, a, um, it's a journey for everyone in the modern slavery space. So we chose to risk assess and categorise our, our um, suppliers against the modern slavery risk. Um, so we only went out to our category A, um, high risk, high spend suppliers, so that when they responded, we could engage in those deep conversations. Um, so we might move now, just keeping it quite brief, into the Q&A part of the session. So I'll hand over um, to Sharon. Hi, thank you, Petey. Thank you, Robin. 
Terrific. Uh, we'll move on to the questions. The first question um, I might direct to uh, Robin. Uh, what do you reply to businesses that are saying now is not the time to worry about human rights when we're dealing with COVID and an economic downturn? Wow. Um, yes, it's a, it's a curly question, um, Sharon. Uh, there's a lot of organisations, I think, which are coping with a lot of different priorities right now. Economic downturn, uh, COVID, uh, very unpredictable markets. I think now is the time to embed human rights. Now is the time to make sure that human rights and modern slavery issues are, as I said, foundation stones, cornerstones of what you do, because the relationships that you build with your supply chains now are the ones that will carry you through and that will actually make your business not just have a purpose, as Andrew was saying, not just able to work with its suppliers, as Nicholas and Peter was saying, but successful in the years to come. Thanks, Robin. Uh, perhaps a question for you, Andrew, um, one from um, Alan, one of our uh, listeners. Uh, question is, what is your view on the way large companies put ethical sourcing down the list of importance? How do we get to the people at the top end of companies, directors and shareholders, to realise that ethical ways can have a big impact on profit if ignored? I think... It's a great question and I think my point would be um, directors of companies and CEOs don't want to wake up in the morning and find their company's name, brand or their faces on the front line of a newspaper uh, that is damaging their brand or their service. So I think, frankly, a bit of dissonance doesn't go astray where one points out, if you're in procurement, that this is very important, the risks of reputation and the risks long term for this company uh, are not worth taking when frankly, we can choose a supplier that gives us the product or service that we want uh, with all the ethical and, and other considerations intact. And if price is the only consideration, then lay all that out before those decision makers uh, and point out that you know, that's why they have to uh, you know, back something that might be overall better for their company, irrespective of the fact that the price may be high. Sharon, may I, uh, may I just add to Andrew's? I'm not uh, disagreeing, I'm adding to what Andrew is saying. I think there's a lot of organizations around, not just Australia, but around the world that have been used to dealing with risk and they've been looking at business risk. They've been looking at market and operational and as Andrew said, reputational risk uh, and uh, financial risk. The risk of harm to people is a fundamental risk that needs to be looked at alongside all of these. And for many organizations, it's quite a new thing. So every risk matrix for the next year needs to start including risk of harm to people. And of course, you know, that purpose alongside those other four to really be uh, one, managing its risk properly, but two, gearing up uh, for a very different uh, supply chain. Thanks, Robin. Um, Nicholas, I might go to you. What other sectors might be suitable for a shared application approach similar to the Property Council of Australia? Oh, really good question, Sharon. Um, look, I, th I think it, it lends itself to any sector. And uh, we're, we're just actually about to launch two more industry-led uh, approaches. One is in the healthcare insurance sector and the other one in the utility sector. But Unless the sector has very sort of a secretive supply chains, uh, I think collaboration is the absolutely best way to go ahead with it. it, it it's more efficient, it's more effective, and you have a much, much bigger impact. I think PT would agree with me here if Stockland went out uh, on their own and said, look, supply, we'd like you to behave this way. That's one thing. But if an entire industry says that, that's an entirely different uh, approach. So there'll be more impact. And I think that's what we all want to achieve. We want to eradicate modern slavery as, as one of the core topics here today. Absolutely. Uh, Nicholas, I couldn't agree more. Just the leverage that you create by bringing an industry together to work with suppliers, that, that's golden. Yeah. Petey, perhaps extending on that, a question from Matthew. Um, how do we collaborate, synergize, so that suppliers don't need to com complete this for each buyer? And, and look, that is the fundamental piece around um, the reason why we created this platform with 
uh, the PCA and Inform 365 so that we wouldn't have 15 different companies asking 15 different sets of questions to the suppliers. So our suppliers now, um, if we invite, say, contractor A uh, to fill out the questionnaire, they can then say, all right, I also supply to, you know, um, Stockland's competitor X, Y, and Z. And that information is just there for them when our competitors want to access that. So it really is reducing the burden on our supplier base, which I think is, you know, fantastic for the industry. And it's an important part, Petey, to again, to add to that, I'll stop doing this in a moment, but, you know, three, okay. of, the, three of the core principles were one, this needs to be transparent everybody needs to be able to see the question set. Two, that it's transformative. It builds capacity as it goes. It's not just a snapshot in time. And three, PD, to, you know, to, to, to tailor, tailor in with what you were saying, that it's free, that it's free for suppliers to go and Absolutely. log in. It's not like some of the other platforms where there is a supplier cost, which is a sole trader you might struggle with, but it's free. And to build again on what you're saying, Robin, the fourth point being some of these companies are reporting entities themselves, and it's a tool that they can use to actually measure how they're growing year on year to be able to report back to the federal government themselves. Can I build on that as well? I'm going to build on the building on the building. Uh, what we're also seeing is that some of the tier one suppliers to the property council now are joining the platform as well. And via them, we've got instant visibility into the tier two. And if we can sort of roll that down, uh, we're, going to have, we're going to have much quicker transparency in the entire supply chain. So that's another benefit. Thank you. Um, another question which I'll just put out there for everyone, and it's just, what does the gold standard for modern slavery prevention look like? Could you share any references or tools that we could use to start a conversation on this at our organisations, the gold standard for modern slavery prevention? I might start on that if I may. Yeah. Oh. No, you, you go, Robin, I'll, I'll build, yeah. I think there are some excellent examples worldwide. Uh, organizations like Stockland and Mervac here in Australia, uh, people like British Land um, or um, Balfour Beatty over in the UK, but international organizations that have understood that this is not about a directive to their suppliers. We want you to do this. Go and improve your, the human rights. It, it's, this is a two-way street and this is a relationship. And so there are organizations where you can, every, all of us can go to the website, can look at supplier codes of conduct, procurement policies, vendor codes of conduct, but also look at what the organization is offering, it, not so much in exchange, but alongside that. And so, you know, an organization that says, we will provide capacity building and training. We will pay our suppliers on time. We will work with them towards the goals. And in exchange, we want our suppliers to start looking through their tier two, tier three, tier four, adopt human rights policies. And the ones that build those relationships, I think really are the gold standard because they're clear, they're transparent, and they also aren't saying, hey, we've got a perfect supply chain. They're saying, we're aware of where our weaknesses are and we want to work with suppliers to build those. Yeah, totally agree. I think um, two builds on that. One is um, what, it's difficult to pinpoint what is a gold standard because I think, um, everyone is at a different stage on their journey with this. And so many companies have different levels of risk, um, different levels of sophistication, different access um, to resources to deal with it as well. So um, intent, but then delivering on that intent um, is, is key. Um, and then I think it's easier to say what a gold standard isn't. Um, and that is, it's not ticking boxes. It's not saying, yes, we are uh, slavery free because that just tells you that they don't really understand where slavery might exist in their supply chain. So there's a whole heap of stuff that it's not. Um, and it's very difficult to um, say what it is exactly because of the complexity with it. 
Thank you. Um, taking a different tact here, um, and perhaps um, Andrew or Nicholas might want to address this. Any tips on how to get marketing departments to promote the good work, the good work procurement might be doing in ethical sourcing? Um, well, marketing departments have budgets, which is a good thing, and procurement and HR probably don't. So that I've always liked the idea of using the marketing budget around what the company does as a product or service and tying it in with the values of that company. Um, you know, if Stockland or whatever were promoting a particular product in, when they're doing that. So I think it's communication with the marketing department on what procurement's doing. And that may be, uh, you know, a comment if it was in property around, you know, our, uh, our product, you know, uses sustainable raw materials and uh, has a whole, and, and we make a whole bunch of decisions that you would make in use marketing uh, jargon for, but ultimately you're telling your, uh, your end consumer that when the purchasing and procurement area make decisions, that ties into the overall quality of the product, which raises the standard and makes it ethical and uh, at the highest uh, sustainable standard it can be, as an example. Same goes with culture. I've always ama been amazed why marketing departments, when they're selling products or service, don't also constantly send a message about why this company would be a great company to work for and send messages about our culture and this is what we believe in and you know um, whatever the company is that, that sort of inculcating that into the product or service. So I think have a good session and communication with them and, and that's how you'll convince marketing departments that it's in their interest because um, it'll ultimately send a better message to your end consumer. But if I can just add on to that, I think internally, um, there, there's a lot of to integrate within your own organization are really engaged in this and then use marketing to sort of um, push that message out as well not only externally but also internally as well because I, I think we all need to really work together on this one in any case so it just helps the cause anyway Terrific, thanks. Great lot of questions coming in here at an amazing rate. So let me keep going. Um, how can we, this is to all of you, how can we ensure that our leaders are groomed to truly value sustainability and see the intrinsically linked between sustainability and resilience? Well, that's a cultural issue at a leadership level. Um, I mean, all of you have choices about who you work for. You can make a decision every day. I, I say that as a recruiter, I suppose. But uh, I think it's important, you know, uh, we all get out of bed in the morning. 99.9% .9 of us want to do a great job. And I think so one of the things I'd encourage you all to do is, is just be sure that your personal values and, and ethical standards and what you believe in are aligned with the company you work for. That's a cultural issue. That starts from the top, but I think messages can rise from the bottom up. So I think it's, a, it's an ongoing conversation that should be uh, vital in that organization. And, and frankly, smart leadership today understands that if we're going to be a successful company long-term and sustain not just profits, but our reputation and what we contribute to society, then it, it should be as transparent and as authentic as possible. And frankly, that motivates people to come to work. They want to work, people want to work for companies that have this their values aligned with their own and who are contributing positively to society. So I think start the debate, whether it's at your team level or your divisional level, uh, but be, be positively vocal about it. I think it's I important. I love that, Andrew. I think the cultural thing is, is absolutely spot on. And, um, you know, I feel really lucky to be working at Stockland with the values. And it certainly was a draw card for me when, when I chose the company I wanted to work for. Um, I think it also relates back to the previous question around how do you get your marketing guys to spend the money on uh, selling the story. It all comes back to the same thing, right? It's about um, employee engagement, it's customer enga engagement, but it's also ESG investment. So depending on the size of your organisation, the ESG investors, they want to know what you're doing now. And, and they're not going to invest in your company unless you can show that you're being socially responsible. And they're doing that for a reason. And that's because if you're not socially responsible, you're not going to be sustainable in the future. And by sustainable, I mean giving a sustainable profit 
year on year into the future. Um, it's, it's a known business case. So I think it's about, yes, it's definitely about culture, but it's also about having those smart leaders that get that, that actually understand this is a business proposition as much as it is um, doing good for the world. I think it's important bearing in mind what we've been talking about to acknowledge that partnership is the new leadership. There are so many issues we're talking about with procurement and supply chain where one organization going it alone is not enough, is not going to have enough leverage and partnership is truly the new leverage. And I don't just mean partnership like this, the, the great one within Form 365 and, and the Property Council. I mean partnering with NGOs and partnering with civil society and partnering with smaller organizations in indigenous and overseas to actually look at what, what is the voice of the worker in different parts of our supply chain? How do we hear that? So one, partnership is the new leadership. And secondly, I guess uh, from what Andrew and Petey were saying, Culture starts at the top and for all the words about marketing and I, I love my marketing brethren, marketing a rap, marketing uh, any of these things means nothing if you then go and do, if your actions do not fall in line with that. And so, you know, that culture starts at the top and you need leadership that embed human rights as part of the business ethic. Thank you. Uh, question. Say, Sharon, just one quick thing on that. I mean, we, we, we get to see a lot of organizations and it's interesting to see. Um, we have, we, we speak to a lot of people engaged in the ESG space and they join a company. Uh, they're really passionate about it and the leadership and the culture is just old school. And we've done it like this for the last 50 years and these people leave. But I think they chip away as they leave, they're starting to chip away at those old structures and making ESG a topic that people start, have to start listening to whether they like it or not. And I think that's quite critical as well. Everyone has to make their little contribution to this. Sometimes you make the impact, sometimes you don't, but you'll even make a small impact. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, so many great questions coming through. Um, if we don't get them all answered today, we will respond and send them through. Uh, question from Hayley. How has meaningful change in the modern slavery and human rights space been impacted by the Dunning-Kruger effect? That is cognitive bias, whereby people who are incompetent at something are unable to recognise their own competence, incompetence. Who um, wants to tackle that one? Good grief. Um, I will say, um, with only a hint of tongue in cheekness, there's a lot of middle aged white dudes sitting in boardrooms talking about how we hear the voice of the worker and um, grievance mechanisms that are entirely built around listening to other middle aged white dudes. So I think there is a lot, you know, whether you want to talk about Dunning Kruger or, or actually genuine diversity, there is a lot that uh, the, the current human rights and modern slavery dialogue is throwing up that is showing how little we are genuinely listening to our supply chains and how that dynamic needs to change if we're going to have any hope of being a sustainable business. Thanks. Thanks, Robin. Another one that I'm going to throw out to the panel, um, knowing that from Tanya, knowing there is no such thing as modern slavery free supply chain, how has the information the suppliers have provided led to positive action? So we, we're just at the start. Um, so we're, I guess there's two, we're, we're running, um, two paths, if you like. So part of it is around setting up the, the, the housekeeping, the housekeeping and the framework, the stuff that you need to have in play to be able to do effective due diligence. So have they got policies and procedures in place to even enable their people to raise grievances? So that's one piece. The other piece is we're doing some pilot projects to go deeper. We're doing some deep dives. Uh, we haven't found modern slavery yet. Again, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. We just haven't come across it. We have found um, areas that there has been instances of um, underpayment, which have been resolved straight away. Um, so um, 
I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm answering the question. I guess what I'm saying is it's a journey. We're in kind of year one of what we're doing. So it will evolve over time as well. Um, and I, I hope that, you know, we and others will, will keep going deeper and um, as we learn, keep getting more sophisticated about um, how we engage with our suppliers and deeper into the supply chain. I, I guess a good analogy is the health and safety space. If you look at the health and safety space back in the 90s or early 2000s, it was almost optional. If I look at, say, a construction site, work boots, optional, high-vis shirts, optional. Now it's standard. There, there, there's no way. There's health and safety that is totally entrenched. That's business as usual. And I think, well, my hope is, and I think the panel's hope here, probably if I can speak on behalf of everyone here, is that that becomes business as usual as well. But that, as Petey's just said, it is a journey. I mean, we're on that journey. And, and I, I just simply add, it's like anything... Uh, certainly in interviewing, if you don't ask the right question, you'll get the wrong answer. And I think what, what I like about transparency and collecting the data is it begins the journey to ask the question. So first of all, there's no accidental uh, crossing the line where you thought what you were getting was ethical and sustainable and wasn't illegal, and it turns out it was. But um, I think, you know, we're by shining a spotlight in the process of collecting the data, being able to access it quickly and easily, has got to be a starting point. We all know better, better quality data, better quality decisions. Thank you, thank you. Um, look, we're, we're nearing time and what we might just do is get one final comment from all of our speakers and we'll start with you, Andrew. Um, your final comments for today. Well, all of you like me wake up every day and think of the future, try to learn and grow and improve one's position in life and one's family. And I hope today, if there's been a few ideas that you've got, that means every decision and choice you make when you are in very important roles in your supply chain decisions, especially at the moment where you're perhaps considering a diversification and, and, uh, and uh, removing dependency, that you think about these things. And if it's raised the level of your thinking and your, um, your questioning, uh, at the highest possible ethical level, then you're all being the best version that you can be of yourselves. And that's actually how we all change the world and make it a better place. It's not big leaps, it's all of us trying to be the best that we can be, making better quality decisions and all these little things, and then collectively we move in the right direction. So thanks for joining. Thank you. Nicholas. Uh, look, I, th I think my message is if you, if you have the opportunity to collaborate, then collaborate. That, that's the way we're going to have the impact that we all want. Uh, so I'm going to leave it at that. Collaborate if you can. Thank you. Robin? Uh, I think I'd wrap it up by saying, uh, you know, as I mentioned, coherence across the business is going to be really important. You can't prioritize everything at the same time, but at least once a year, you need to work out what your priorities are and how you're going to communicate those to your suppliers. And if human rights are a priority, then that needs to be a foundation stone. That cannot be compromised. Beyond that, there are lots of great frameworks, the Sustainable Development Goals set out by the UN, uh, the International Standard for Sustainable Procurement, ISO 2400, which will reinforce all of this work and help establish those frameworks, you know, beyond these industry collaborations to help you make progress over time. Thank you. And Petey. Um, look, I think just to reiterate that, you know, respecting human rights, is a fundamental of effective risk management, which obviously in turn is a fundamental to sustainable uh, profit. And ultimately it's the individual that makes the difference. So if you bring passion around human rights to what you do every day, um, it's gonna make the world a better place and it's gonna make your business more sustainable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and if I can be so bold and answer one of the questions that came out, uh, what tools do you use to fully understand the risk of modern slavery? I encourage everybody go to go 
to the, here's the plug to the SIPS website, um, but we have an ethical procurement and supply e-learning and online test, and this continues to help professionals build their confidence in this in this area and also be um, better better advised in this area. So I certainly get, encourage you to have a look at that um, online learning. Um, procurement and supply chain professionals really need to be strategically position themselves as champions for change promoting the highest standards of, of ethical practice for their organisations and supply chains. So modern slavery is a perfect example of how procurement professionals, by ensuring that they're more transparent supply chains, can step in and not only help safeguard the reputation and longevity of their organisation, but ultimately, make it different to people's lives. So I really want to thank the speakers for their participation today. It's been such an insightful and well worth um, presentation. So many thank you, thanks to you all. And thanks to everybody else for joining the webinar. Um, to, to the attendees, um, we really hope that you find, found this insightful. But um, before you leave today, we do ask that you take the post-event, uh, post-webinar survey and a copy of the webinar and a, and a list of any unanswered questions will be emailed to you next week. Uh, we'd also like you to, to invite you to join it at, at us at our next webinar on Thursday the 17th of June at 12 noon Australian Eastern Standard Times and that's Future Proofing Your Career Series, SIPS Professional Qualifications Pathways. So um, please visit the SIPS website or LinkedIn page for more information. We encourage you um, to continue practicing social distancing and to play our collective effort in tackling the coronavirus outbreak. Until then, we meet again. Stay safe and be well, everyone. Thank you.